Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Lauren Edgar, and I am the Associate Director of Clinical Affairs and Education at the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. Dr. Gertz is the Roland Sadler Jr. Professor of the Art of Medicine and Chair Emeritus of the Department of Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. He has also served as Chair of the Division of Hematology and Chair of the Department of Medicine at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. He currently serves on the editorial boards for amyloidosis, acta hematologica, and clinical lymphoma and myeloma, and looks forward to becoming chair of the hematology board for the American Board of Internal Medicine. While most of you may be familiar with our organization, Amyloidosis Research Consortium's mission is to improve and extend the lives of those with amyloidosis. ARC is committed to the collaborative efforts that accelerate the pace of discovery, expand patient access to the most effective care, and improve short and long-term outcomes. Working with partners in industry, government, and academia, ARC seeks to spark innovation and to bring promising treatments from labs to clinics. ARC's outreach and education inform and empower patients, families, caregivers, physicians, and researchers. We pride ourselves in being a science-based patient organization, working to de-risk drug development by strategically implementing programs, which we believe are critical to better care for patients and facilitate and accelerate drug development in these rare diseases. Our focus leans towards improving the speed and accuracy of diagnoses, increasing our understanding of the genetics, biology, and natural history of amyloidosis to identify new treatments. Thirdly, accelerating regulatory approval and reimbursement of effective treatments for patients. And lastly, enhancing care and quality of life of patients and caregivers throughout their amyloidosis journey. We here at ARC would like to send a special thank you to the organizations sponsoring this program. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the Q&A box on your Zoom control panel. Questions will be entertained at the close of the speaker presentation. However, feel free to place your questions throughout the presentation as we go along. Now, without further ado, I will turn the time over to Dr. Gertz. Thank you for being here, Dr. Gertz. Thank you, Dr. Edgar. So just setting the stage, I'll be talking about how new treatments for amyloid are developed within the context of clinical trials. So to try and understand exactly what we're trying to achieve, I'll ask those people who have AL amyloidosis to focus on what I say about the development of daratumumab, trade name Darzalex, because this was developed through clinical trials, and I'll walk through the mechanism. For those of you that have ATTR cardiomyopathy, typically wild type, I'll be talking about Tefamidus and how it was developed. Its trade names, if you're not familiar, are Vindamax and Vindaquil. For those patients who have amyloid TTR peripheral neuropathy, the variant or mutated type, the inherited form of amyloid, I'll talk about Patisseran, trade name on Patro, Tegseti, trade name Inotirsin, and Vutriceran, trade name on Vutra. And so clinical trials, the first question is why clinical trials at all? Why do we need clinical trials? And the real issue here is that, number one, all clinical trials have a question to answer. Usually the question is, is a current treatment worth bringing forward? Is there something we're onto that will benefit globally the patient population with amyloidosis? Now, in order to have a drug made available for all of you, 
it has to be approved by the FDA. And that means it needs to be found to be safe and effective. And then the question is, well, how do you determine safe and effective? And usually that's done through scientific trials. Scientific trials are also referred to as protocols. So sometimes we'll talk about enrolling patients on a protocol. That's just another way of saying a clinical trial. And so it really isn't possible to bring new successful breakthrough treatments to the population without subjecting them to rigorous evaluation in the context of the clinical trials. So that's a necessity. Who's developing the clinical trials? This is very important for you to be aware because clinical trials are usually developed in collaboration with global thought leaders in amyloidosis. The people who are helping design a clinical trial are actually the people who know the most there is to know about amyloidosis worldwide. And they're not in it to design a failing trial. They're in this to try and move the needle forward, help the patient population live longer and live better. So the people who are behind these clinical trials really have a very powerful incentive to do the best that they possibly can for the patients that are ultimately enrolling in these clinical trials. And it should give you a sense of, of ease to know that the people who are involved are thought leaders who are very, very knowledgeable about amyloidosis. Now, anytime we talk about medical research, things can get a little bit touchy because you just kind of wonder, well, wait a minute, am I being experimented on? Am I a guinea pig? And so I want to outline for you the really extensive federal regulations and protections that exist to ensure that anybody enrolling in a clinical trial has their rights protected, that they're receiving the safest possible treatment, and that there is a potential for real benefit for these patients. So I talked about Darzalex, Vindaquil, Onpetro, uh, Texeti, and Vutricerin. All of these came to the market because patients participated in clinical trials. And for some of them, these are patients who received these highly effective medicines four to five years before the general population were able to access them. If you will, they got in on the ground floor of a hot new therapy. And by allowing themselves to participate in clinical trials, they actually availed themselves of benefits that if they had waited for commercial approval can take years. And sometimes those delays can result in irreversible problems with regard to your nerves or your heart or your kidneys that might have been prevented with clinical trial in enrollment. More about the protections. When a clinical trial is activated, if you will, a protocol, it usually is activated at multiple institutions globally. Therefore, it becomes very important that everybody do everything the same way so that the information that we gain is interpretable. This ultimately turns into significant benefit for patients because these protocols specify specifically all the testing that needs to be done before you begin the treatment. So you can be assured, since this has been developed by all these experts, you can be certain that all the appropriate testing relevant to your type of amyloid has been completed before you begin any treatment. In addition, there is pre-specified for every patient safety monitoring because paramount in these clinical trials is ensuring that when we're dealing with medicines that haven't been administered to a large number of patients, that we understand the safety profiles and the testing that's done to ensure safety 
also pre-specified. So people on clinical trials can be reassured that they're having state-of-the-art investigations prior to enrollment and state-of-the-art monitoring. And all of these pre-treatment tests and monitoring tests, again, designed by thought leaders around the world saying, what is the best way to ensure that a patient with AL or ATTR or mutant inherited ATTR is A, we're getting all the right tests to monitor benefit. And at the same time, we ensure that we're providing the safest possible treatment so that if there are side effects, we can intervene. In fact, for almost all of these trials, there are pre-specified dose modifications because most side effects from medicines that we engage in, 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 in practice are usually dose-related, and you can manage those side effects by dose reduction. And these trials actually take away, which is a good thing, the physician or the provider's discretion and will say, you must reduce the dose if you see this side effect. And in fact, if you have a serious potential side effect, it tells you, you must stop the treatment. You must wait for the side effect to resolve before you actually resume treatment. So there's a tremendous about, amount of safety built in federal regulatory oversight, regular monitoring. We have what we call clinical trial monitors that come and audit and ensure we're doing all the tests we say we're doing and that we're complying with all the rules of the protocol, which are fundamentally designed to protect you. So that's the people developing it, why we develop it, and how we ensure that we're not really doing unethical experimentation on you. We also have very well defined who can participate and who can't participate. And we do that again so that we're treating a uniform group of patients so that the results are interpretable. And I'll, I'll just tell you that for trials with Darzalex and Vindaquil, those trials, for example, excluded patients who had very advanced heart failure. They were not eligible because we were afraid that number one, A, they may not tolerate the treatment very well. It may be too hard on them if their heart was not operating very efficiently. But there also was another important reason in that sometimes if you test medicines that are effective, but you test them on patients who are very, very, very late in the diagnosis and have advanced organ damage. Sometimes you don't help them, and then you actually miss benefit that might have been apparent for patients with milder disease. So there are guardrails about not having advanced disease so we don't overlook benefit, but also not usually dealing with patients who are symptom-free because if you have no symptoms at all, it's hard to measure and say you're better because you were feeling fine to begin with. So there's some minimum and maximum that we do in order to ensure that we can actually say our treatment is working. Now, clinical trials occur in phases. So typically, when a clinical trial is done, first thing you do with medicines is you see if they work in the test tube. If they work in the test tube and show activity, usually what you will then do is animal studies. Those animal studies can range from mice, rats, to primates also so we can understand the effectiveness, whether there are risks to treatment, and whether what we do need to monitor to be sure we're ensuring safety. But once we get the test tube studies, and animal safety data, we're ready to embark on the very first experiments in, these are experiments, but trials in patients. The first trial is phase one. And phase one trials were done for Darzalex, Vindaquil, Onpatro, Inotursin, and Amvutra. All of those underwent phase one. What phase one is all about is we have a drug 
We know it works in the test tube, but we're really not very sure. Well, what's the right dose? And how often should we be giving this medicine? And so in very early exploration, what we do is phase one to try and determine what's the correct dose. So typically what we'll do is we'll start at a very, very low dose. And of course that's done because we're not 100% certain of the safety profile in people. And we want to be sure above all that we don't hurt anybody and we want to be sure that it's safe. So we start at a very tiny dose and we'll give it to three people. Once we give it to three people, the study stops. We don't give it to any more people until we're sure those three people are doing okay after a specified interval, let's say four weeks or eight weeks. And if everything's good, then we can open it to three more people, but at a higher dose. And we'll keep opening and closing, enrolling patients, monitoring for good effects and bad effects. And once we do that, then we continue to increase the dose until we reach the maximum tolerated dose. And we do that as follows. If we treat three people and everybody has no bad side effects, we increase the dose. But if one person in three gets a bad side effect, we take three more at that same dose level. And if the next three do well, so one person in six had a bad side effect, we increase the dose. And we keep increasing the dose until two of six or two of three, if it happens consecutively, get a bad side effect. And then we say, that dose is too much and we lower the dose. And of course, we're raising the dose so slowly that the side effects that we see tend to be minimal and, and reversible so that we don't go too high. Now, that's usually the dose that we begin testing, the maximum tolerated dose. Now, in reality, what we're all interested in actually isn't the maximum tolerated dose. What we really want is the minimally effective dose. But the first thing is to find out how much we can give safely, and then we can move forward and fine tune if we can get away with less. So that's phase one. What's the dose? What's the frequency of administration? Most patients who participate in those trials have to have blood tests many, many, many times during because we need to know how long is the medicine in your bloodstream? When does it disappear? That helps us figure out how often we give the medicine. If the medicine is gone in two hours, we're probably going to have to give it once a day, more than once a day. If it disappears in five days, maybe once a week. If it disappears in four weeks, we can give it once a month. The technical term, not important, but we call that pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, integral to phase one studies as we figure out how frequently we do it. When that was done for tefamidus, it turned out in phase one, we never hit a maximum tolerated dose. We gave a big dose. There weren't any side effects. We said, that's what we're going to do. For on Petro, we gave that and we found three weeks. We would have to repeat the dose every three weeks in order to keep the level of the mutant TTR low. The same, and for Tegsetti, the pharmacokinetics said, oh, you have to give it once a week under the skin to keep the levels low, and for Ambutra, once every three months. But in any case, those trials for the different medicines help establish what's the dosing and what's the frequency. And once that happens, you move on from phase one to phase two. So a phase two trial Really now we know what the dose is and we know what the frequency is and we know by this time the safety profile. We know what to look for. So for example, if you've been on Tegsetti, after the phase one trial, you kind of know you need to check the platelet count once a week and you need to check the urine every three months. And if you're on Darzalex, you have to watch for upper respiratory infections and suppression of the normal healthy infection-fighting antibodies or immunoglobulins. 
So these are all known, but now we move to phase two. And again, what we're doing is we're now trying to say, okay, now we're going to really drill down on effectiveness. So phase one was mostly dosing and safety, and phase two was effectiveness. In both phase one and phase two, there's no placebo. Nobody's getting a sugar pill. Everybody's getting treated. And what we're trying to find out with a phase two, for example, is in patients with AL amyloidosis, how often does Darzalex lower the light chain level? In patients who received on Petro, Tegseti, and Vutra, what happens to the levels of TTR in the blood, the amyloid protein? What happens to your neurological disability and what happens to the quality of your life? As we're measuring these serially to find out, you know, you ask your doctor, well, what's the response rate? How many people benefit? That comes from these phase two trials. 60%, 80%, 90%, 30% comes from the phase two trial. But even when you get a response rate, for most disorders, even that's still not enough to prove efficacy. Then we move to phase three, and phase three is a direct comparison of whatever is the current standard of care to the new treatment. So when we look at the development of Darzalex for AL amyloidosis, the phase three trial took patients newly diagnosed and untreated and took the standard of care. And the standard of care for AL amyloidosis is chemotherapy to kill the plasma cells in the bone marrow that make the amyloid. That's been the standard of care for 20 years. And the backbone of that chemotherapy is bortezomib, trade name Velcade. So what it did is it took Velcade-based chemotherapy and compared it with Velcade-based chemotherapy with Darzalex. And in this trial, now we have a placebo because we're really trying to find out, did the addition of Darzalex to chemotherapy do any better than the chemotherapy we've been losing, using for 20 years? So even though it was a placebo, no patient received less than the standard of care, which is Velcade-based chemotherapy. That's how everyone has been treated for 20 years, and you did not receive any less than that, but some people received Darzalex. And at the end of it, it turned out that people who got Darzalex actually had a significant lowering of their light chains and improved heart and kidney function compared to chemotherapy alone. And so the FDA finally approved it for the use in AL amyloidosis. But an important point about these trials, you say, well, what about the people who got placebo? Most of these trials have what's called open label extension. And actually what happens here is that the trial meets its goal of, let's say, enrolling 200 people. Let's just say that's what it was. And 100 got chemo and 100 got chemo plus Darzalex. Well, after the trial closes and the response assessment is done, those people who got placebo were offered to get Darzalex, even though the drug is still not approved for use. Those people who turned out to get placebo were said, okay, we're done and we thank you for your participation. You didn't get Darzalex. Would you like it now? We will provide it to you. And of course, with all these investigational drugs, it's not a bad thing, but they're all given to you for free. None of the drugs are approved, so there's no charge to receive these drugs. And so although people on placebo didn't get less than the standard of care, they actually still got in and received Darzalex earlier because once you have a trial done, FDA approval is still two years away. And you can get this through this open label extension. So ultimately, everybody got the effective drug, some later than others. Tefamidus or Vindiquil, was restricted to patients with amyloid cardiomyopathy, heart amyloid. 
and it was given as a pill, and this also was placebo controlled. Why? Well, before the introduction of Indiquil, the standard of care for ATTR cardiomyopathy was nothing. There are no approved drugs. So you could take a diuretic. Maybe you could take something to control your heart rate. Maybe you needed a pacemaker or some device like that to help enhance your heart function. But there wasn't really an anti-amyloid treatment for the heart. And so since the standard of care was there wasn't one, it was completely ethical, completely ethical for some of the patients to receive the Vindiquil and the others not. But once again, once the accrual target was met and all the people enrolled, the patients on placebo were offered to start the medicine in the open label extension long before FDA approved it and your doctor could prescribe it. So there you have differences where there's an established care you get the standard of care like Velcade-based chemo, plus or minus. When there's no established care, then you get a placebo because there really isn't any effective treatment known. Finally, for the inherited types of TTR neuropathy, on Petro, Texeti, and Vutriceran, and Butra, they were all the same as well. Prior to their introduction of these gene silencers, the treatment for this type of neuropathy was liver transplantation. Well, that's just not something you just, oh, sure, I'll go do that. You're going to think pretty hard about that when you're instead offered a shot. And what was done in these gene silencing trials, again, since there really wasn't a standard of care, since the number of people who got liver transplants was very, very small in this population, was again, there was a placebo control. So they compared on Petro to placebo, Texeti to placebo. However, at the end of 15 months, when the trials were done and the quality of life and the six minute walk testing, the endpoints of the trial were done, Every single patient was offered the drug. So if you were on placebo, you could start the drug. If you weren't on placebo, you wanted to stop the drug, you could, but almost nobody did. They said, oh, no, I'm staying on it. That's fine. And again, I like the price at zero. And so these patients received, whether they were on placebo or not on placebo, received very, very early access to really blockbuster treatments that revolutionized the treatment of this type of amyloid, essentially eliminating liver transplant. Now, I'll just talk a little bit about Ambutra. That's the second generation drug for inherited amyloid. And the other one that's not approved yet is Eplon Tercin, which is the successor drug to Tegseti. So those trials, this is important. Now, in one arm, you receive the Amvutra or the Eplon Tercin, but the other arm wasn't placebo anymore because now we have an established therapy. So now the established therapies on Patro and Tegseti. So that was the comparator arm for those patients. Nobody gets a placebo once there's an established treatment. So what the non-treatment arm looks like depends on what's available. And so now as we're developing new drugs for ATTR cardiomyopathy, the trials don't allow you not to be on tefamidus. Tefamidus is Vindiquil is a standard of care. So even though we're testing a new drug, you still get to take Vindiquil. We don't tell you to stop Vindiquil because it's an effective drug for the treatment of amyloidosis. So actually what happens is the bar keeps getting higher and higher as we develop new treatments because once you have an established treatment, placebo would be unethical. No doctor would agree to enroll patients on the trial. Now, some of you may wonder, how do I find out about clinical trials? Well, the ARC has a navigator that you can access that will give you clinical trials. The master file is clinicaltrials.gov. One word, clinicaltrials, no spaces, .gov. 
you go there, you type amyloidosis in, it will list every single clinical trial registered globally for the treatment of amyloidosis. And it tells who can participate, who can't participate, and you can actually find out if you have an opportunity to get in on the ground floor for one of these new agents. So briefly, before I go on to the questions, I'll just mention a little bit. So where are we right now with clinical trials? And there are so many because the research in amyloid is so active. I don't know all the trials. But there are a number of very important trials that are underway. New gene silencing treatments are being looked at for patients with ATTR amyloid that shut down production. And these silencers are being used not just in the inherited form of amyloid, they're also being used for ATTR cardiomyopathy to lower the ATTR levels so that to see if patients will live longer and live better with gene silencing. Next generation stabilizers. When I say stabilizers, I'm talking about Vindiquil tefamidus, which stabilizes the development of amyloid. It prevents the amyloid protein from developing by making the molecule, the TTR, remain biodegradable in your system. And so it doesn't accumulate. Next generation exists. And very importantly, antibodies, also referred to as depleters, have become available on trial from three different companies that are designed not to attack the production of the amyloid, which everything else has been, let's stop amyloid from being produced, but let's give something that might go into the tissues and actually dissolve the amyloid deposits out of the tissues and get rid of them. So we're actually using these antibodies to attack, number one, the production. But what about the amyloid that's already in my system, the amyloid that's already in my heart or kidneys or bowel or blood pressure regulator? Antibody to go in and take those out so there's actually less amyloid. And of course, I focused on treatment. Most people are interested in treatment, but that's not the only types of clinical trials for amyloid. There are clinical trials of imaging agents. Wouldn't it be nice if you could get a scan or an imaging and it said, oh, you have amyloid or you don't have amyloid? Or if you have amyloid, Where's the amyloid? Or if you have amyloid and you know where the amyloid is and you're getting treatment, image, is the amyloid getting better or is the amyloid getting worse and we need to make a change in your treatment? So there's imaging, there's treatment. There are also trials that actually are trying to look at factors that determine prognosis. So those are genetic studies on cells in the bone marrow. And there are a lot of university centers that are collecting samples from patients with amyloid to do research to further understand the biology of the disease. I think with that kind of high-level overview, I think maybe I'll stop at that point, and then maybe we can turn to the questions. I can start with the one question that's in the chat. Dr. Edgar, did you want to just kind of take control at this point? Yes, Dr. Gertz, thank you so much. That was a fantastic overview of clinical trials and their phases and how, or as I should say, where particular medications based on clinical manifestations or even phenotype um, uh, live within those phases. Um, thank you so much. I would like to start with the uh, my first question uh, being particularly there um, when it comes to right to try, where does right to try come into play with these drugs when they're in phase three clinical trials, either now or once the trial has ended during the open label extension? You mentioned that. Yeah, this has changed an awful, awful lot just in the last 10 years. Um, right to try is often 
considered compassionate use of a medication to treat a disease mm -hmm. when you're not enrolled in the trial. And the FDA has become very severe about this over the years and made it, at least in my experience at Mayo Clinic, next to impossible mm -hmm. to secure a drug for compassionate use, either get on the clinical trial, or I'm afraid you are unfortunately shut out until approval comes or open label comes. It's very, very difficult. And there's a lot of issues because most people who seek compassionate use are usually not under the supervision of a clinical trial investigator. By the way, we have to be certified mm -hmm. to be a clinical trial investigator. We have to be what's called FDA 1572 approved to do it. And we also have to have taken courses on the protection of human subjects to be sure we understand what are the regulations and what the ethical boundaries are. But what ends up happening is the company is trying to develop a drug to benefit everyone in the world with the disease. And if someone outside the trial gets a drug and gets a bad complication from the drug, the FDA is going to look hard at that and in some instances can put a trial on pause. And so I'm not in the clinical trial, but I want to get the drug for right now. You're pretty close to out of luck. It's very, very hard to obtain a medicine. Usually it's derived from a pharmaceutical company to use, but not in the clinical trial fashion because of the safeguards that have been put in place to ensure the safety and efficacy. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. Uh, my next question uh, is, uh, I am in a Janssen clinical trial for daratumumab. Is there a different clinical name for it? Well, daratumumab is, is trade named by Janssen as Darzalex. And congratulations to you for being in a clinical trial, uh, because A, you're almost certainly going to benefit, and B, you're providing important medical knowledge to the community that will benefit every other patient with AL amyloidosis and future generations. So you've actually contributed to society by your participation in this clinical trial. And um, there have been a number of clinical trials. First, the Darzalex, the Daratum was looked at patients who'd failed every treatment. And then, if, so it was the last thing left. And then it was looked at in newly diagnosed patients, effective. Now it's being looked at maybe in the maintenance treatment after initial therapy is done. Well, maybe we keep you on it to keep the disease at bay. And originally it was given intravenously. And then they did a clinical trial and said, well, maybe we don't have to give it intravenously. Maybe we can give it as a shot under the skin, which is a whole heck of a lot easier than getting an IV stick. And so there are a lot of different trials in terms of that. And then, of course, the question is, well, after you've been on it a year, you have to take it every month. Maybe we could take it every two months or every three months and look and see if we can get away with a little bit less. And so all of those are legitimate questions, but there's no way to answer them without your willingness to enroll yourself in a clinical trial. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. My next question for you is from someone who shares that they have had a stem cell transplant and stayed in remission for 11 years, then received chemo for six months where they stayed in remission for two years uh, now they are starting immunotherapy. Would they be considered for trials in the future? They're very healthy. As oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You'd be saying, I mean, even when, as soon as you relapse from the stem cell transfer, the question comes up, well, would I be eligible for a clinical trial? We're actually, um, we haven't activated yet, but we're looking at CAR-T therapy for AL amyloidosis right after in second line. You've relapsed from a transplant, CAR-T. And of course, the CAR-T will be free and you won't have to worry about insurance clearance because it's all going to be paid for by us, so to speak. And so, of course, you would ask for a clinical trial. However, in this setting, you also have to ask yourself, after 11 years, 
would you benefit from a second stem cell transplant? Would a second stem cell transplant give you another 11 years? Certainly a, tr a second line chemotherapy is reasonable and immunotherapy also very reasonable. But you need to ask, yeah, do you have any clinical trials that are exciting? Or do you want to go on clinicaltrials.gov and look at relapsed AL amyloidosis and see if there are clinical trials? You know, I didn't mention it, but for a lot of the clinical trials, you know, um, the pharmaceutical companies are so driven to ensure that these trials are successfully enrolled that, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'd love to, but, you know, I live pretty far away. You know, it's very hard for me. Well, guess what? Most of the clinical trials I'm involved with in amyloid will fly you to my center with a guest mm -hmm. and your hotel and a stipend for meals. So you essentially have no out-of-pocket costs if you've got the time. And so, well, it's a barrier. We want to enroll patients, but there are very real expenses in getting to uh, amyloid center of excellence, staying nearby in a hotel, eating and the like. And a lot of these companies are saying, you submit your receipts, we'll pay for all of it. So this, and since the drug is free, boy, oh boy, it ends up being access to new treatments relatively inexpensively. That is great information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. My next question, uh, I would like to uh, share uh, comes uh, from someone who says, I continue to give labs for Ando Andromeda, for the Andromeda trial. Yes. I was on the non-DARA arm and achieved VGPR. I am surprised I do not have access to her particular trial lab results with this Andromeda study. Now, she says that she has to contribute mm -hmm. blood twice uh, in order to get her own results. Can you expand on yeah. how the trials are written? So right. So, uh, uh, yeah. This person raises an extremely important point. So first of all, Andromeda was the trial that led to the FDA approval of Darzalex for amyloid. And although Darzalex was on average better by percentages, this individual was fortunate enough to achieve a VGPR without Darzalex. So that was terrific. Um, so you, you got a great response. Um, you're one of the very fortunate ones that got it without Darzalex. It, the really, what it really ended up is that with Darzalex 60%, without Darzalex 30% roughly, it's not like zero. So a third of patients really got deep responses like you did. Now, here's the problem. This Andromeda trial went on in about 40 different countries at about 200 different medical centers. The endpoints included blood light chain level, urinary protein level, levels of the heart blood tests, troponin and NT pro BNP measures of how efficiently your heart's working. Now, what's facing when you're going to the FDA is how can you be sure that the blood test results are exactly the same at all 140 centers? That if the light chain is 30 at your center, it won't be 40 at the other center or 15 at the other center. So to overcome this, what they'll do is they'll have central laboratory where all the blood from all the participants has to be mailed to one laboratory in the world and they run every sample for the purpose of the trial evaluation. But that stuff ends up going to the central lab and you don't get those results. So you often end up with a second set of blood tests that your doctor locally is doing so they can track in real time what's going on. So there's two tracking going on, the central lab for the trial. But of course, your doctor needs to know what your white count is and what your urinary protein and your potassium and your kidney. They need to know not in two weeks in the central lab where it reads it out. They need to know today before we give you your treatment. And so you end up with this dual. So that is a little extra, I'm afraid, when you clinical trial, because you do end up sometimes with double testing. It doesn't happen. So for example, with echocardiogram, 
you get your echocardiogram. The echocardiogram goes on a DVD. The DVD is mailed to a central echo lab and they read it off the DVD. But the blood test, those you your blood is actually shipped wherever the central lab is so that all analyses for all patients were done by the same group. Dr. Gertz, thank you. That was a very uh, thorough answer. Thank you so much for taking the time with that one. Um, the next question uh, is related to a particular variant, ELECT2. Will there be research done, or are you aware of any emerging research yeah. that's going to be done for new therapeutics for ELECT2? So in university laboratories, mm -hmm. ALEC2, which is for those of you who don't, it's, it, it's a form of kidney amyloidosis. It appears to be restricted to specific ethnicities. It's a very uncommon form and almost never is diagnosed without a kidney biopsy. Now, it's not one you're going to figure out until you get a kidney biopsy with mass spec. That's required. And it's generally a surprise diagnosis. It's an extremely, extremely rare form of amyloid. And although in the basic science laboratories, there's work being done on how it misfolds and the like, when you look, and I looked at clinicaltrials.gov, I actually could not find a single therapeutic trial for ALEC2. Most patients ultimately, after a period of time, the most common treatment is kidney transplantation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. Thank you. My next question that I have for you is, how do you participate in clinical trials if insurance denies coverage? That's a great question for which there is not a great answer. Um, I've been around and around quite a bit with insurance companies where we're not paying for research, you know, and you try to talk to the people and say, okay, we're talking about a drug that you will pay for that costs $250,000 a year. I'll put the patient on a clinical trial and they'll get medicine for free and you will save $250,000 and they'll go, no, we don't support clinical trials. That are our policies. So with insurance companies, if you're looking for logic, you're over-assuming. It's very, very difficult. There are policies that say we won't support research. There are some that will support phase three, but not phase one or two. Some will support phase two and three, not phase one. And it's very, very policy specific. And of course, nobody who's a policyholder looks until they get sick when it's kind of late to figure out. And it's really regrettable because well, as I said, you know, patients get better care, standardized care, pre-specified testing, safety assessments that they don't get in community practice necessarily. And so it becomes, you know, a, a shame. But sometimes you write a written appeal to the insurance company and point out the logic of allowing them to participate, which for an insurance company means in the long run, you're going to save money. It will cost you less because, I mean, insurance companies are not a charitable organization. You know, they're either mutual with uh, policyholders or they're publicly traded and they have shareholders. And that means they need to make money. And so they're trying to reduce their expenses. And sometimes the easiest way is to show them that clinical trial participation reduces expenses, but at the same time, sometimes these policies are written in granite and you just, you, no matter who you talk to, physician directors, case managers, sometimes you can't get approval regrettably. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. With, uh, in relation to, I'll start first with uh, clinical trial enrollment. What can you share with regards to clinical trial enrollment that's available in the U.S. versus those who are outside of the U.S. who would like to participate? For instance, they're in South America. Right. So there's a couple of issues that, for example, healthcare economics play an awfully, awfully big role. And there are circumstances in the United States where there is so much access to effective therapies that patients aren't interested in a clinical trial. 
in countries where the healthcare economics are not as robust, sometimes the choice is participate in a clinical trial or get nothing because it's unaffordable. And so what often occurs is that you'll find out that clinical trial accrual in South America, Eastern Europe is better than it is in the United States because the choices are limited. I hate to say it, but it's true that the development of drugs for AIDS wouldn't have occurred if not for Africa. All of the development, most of it, occurred in Africa because there was a large population of HIV positive for whom it was trial participation or no therapy at all. And so underserved populations sometimes have a strong incentive to participate in clinical trials. And I, I know certainly in South America where there's a lot of AL and a lot of variant ATTR, there's been tremendous success in providing new drugs to patients. There are very large centers in Brazil and in Argentina. And again, since they'll often fly you there, you can access these highly effective agents. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Gertz. My next question has to do with ceasing of clinical trials. This particular individual says that their husband has been participating in the CAEL 101 clinical trial for amyloidosis yep. for the past two years. It has been working. Her husband has seen success where amyloid has dissolved. Now, they did just learn last week that they are, being con they are considering ceasing the trial. Is there anything more you can expand on that? Probably not. I mean, you'd need a press release or you'd have to go look at the Kalium website. But uh, again, congratulations for enrolling and for deriving benefit. But, you know, clinical trials stop for two reasons. One, the trial has already been analyzed. It is a success. We're stopping enrollment and we're going to the FDA to get it approved so everybody can get a hold of it. The second possibility is they've done an interim analysis and it wasn't a success and people didn't. You see, you can have some people benefit, but when you look at the aggregate numbers, large numbers, there might not have been benefit. And they'll say, well, we're gonna close the clinical trial because we're not helping our patients and it's wrong to keep them on treatment. I can't distinguish from that statement whether trial closure means success we won or we didn't succeed. Sometimes clinical trials, when they say close, it doesn't mean close. It means they've met their accrual targets. No new patients will be allowed to enter the trial, but patients on treatment will continue to be followed for the pre-specified interval so that we have a better understanding of late outcomes. And so people stay on treatment, but no new patients can enroll. It could be any one of those three. <clears throat> I'd go to the Kalium website and look at Kalium 101 and see because press releases are allowed to be put out before any type of scientific publications appear. Thank you for that, Dr. Gertz. I wonder if that will inform individuals who perhaps have been on Vindamax uh, for uh, one and a half plus years. Uh, that way, perhaps maybe they can, that'll help them to tell if the drug is effective or not. I, I would definitely go to Pfizer and look at that Vindamax website to see uh, where things are, because they usually will, they're actually required to put out these releases blunt for the venture capitalists and the shareholders to have up to date, fully public information. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. Uh, my last question uh, that I'll uh, ask of you, and again, thank you for a wonderful, a wonderful hour. Uh, this next question uh, is from someone who says their father has ATTR wild type, cardiomyopathy as manifestation. Could you explain a little bit more about the new antibody treatments that dissolve amyloid deposits? Particularly well, a, a number of groups are looking at it. Um, uh, Prothena, is looking at antibodies. Atralis is looking at antibodies. And I think looking at clinicaltrials.gov uh, about that, there are no commercially available antibodies to dissolve amyloid deposits. You need to enroll in a clinical trial. And when we talk about particularly promising, I don't know. That's why we do the trial. And that's why we do phase three trial, because you can't, you know, 
know in advance what's going to be a massive success like the drugs I mentioned and which ones turn out to be not worthwhile of further pursuit. But there's the way these trials are designed, there's almost never a downside of participating. Right now you're getting nothing. So if you go on a trial with an antibody and it doesn't work, you're at the same place you started. And if it does work, wow. Absolutely. I love that you bring up how much work is done before the clinical trial or the protocol uh, even begins. And I think that helps to uh, ensure that patients can feel comfortable and empowered knowing that the homework was done even before the protocol was activated. Indeed. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Gertz, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your time spent with us. Uh, I'd like to say thank everyone uh, for joining, as I know that this information that was shared by Dr. Gertz is very important in order to inform individuals on what their next steps are in order to get back to the life that they uh, enjoy having. What uh, I'd like to do is share that we will look to um, share an email that will expand on some of the additional questions that were answered or asked during today's webinar. But again, know that there will also be a post-webinar survey that is included in that follow-up email. Dr. Gertz, any closing comments before we end? No, it's exciting times in amyloid. When I started in 1979, things are not looking very good for treating AL amyloid. And at that time, we still hadn't even recognized ATTR amyloid as a disorder specifically. And now I think the future is so bright for our patient population. But to keep moving forward, we need to keep people enrolling in clinical trials so that we can develop credible information on the efficacy of these treatments so that everyone in future generations can benefit. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate you being here. And thank you again to Dr. Gertz. Thank you to our sponsors and everyone joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Edgar. Thank you, Dr. Gertz. Bye-bye.